On today's episode, the Miami Dolphins continue to add to the defensive line, and they add a name that I've liked since the trade deadline. We'll talk about that move. Plus, the Miami Dolphins brought in two intriguing prospects for visits. It's going to be interesting talking about those, and one of the positions is a big board that's coming up. Plus, we'll talk about Tyree Kill. Is he trolling regarding what he said on Snapchat with Odell Beckham Jr. Do me the favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. We got a ton to talk about on this Friday, so let's get into this. You have got to be kidding me. Jalen Waddle has a Dolphin touchdown. And he will score. The field on the near side. That open. Touchdown. The run from Tua Tungamaloa. Touchdown. He's going deep. He's going to open the touchdown again. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy, Reason. And we are back here for another one. Appreciate all y'all for coming through on this Friday. Hey, man. Uh, sorry, I usually am live on Thursdays, but I had some stuff going on. Neil is in Philadelphia eating cheesesteaks and getting ready for WrestleMania this weekend. So, man, I, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate each and every one of you coming through and showing support on this Friday. I hope wherever you are, I hope you had an amazing week. I hope it was absolutely great. And now guess what? Here's the thing, everyone. We're at the end of it. All right. We're at the end of it. We're at the end of the week and we're getting into the weekend. So, hey, man. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Shout out to each and every one of you that are already coming through and showing love in the chat. Shout out to all of you. Robert Thomason, uh, Jackie Treehorn, Timothy Washington, John Featherlin, um, Kevin Williams, PL, Dolphin Don, Brian Walters, Robbie Sahedo, um, Jason Stamps, Lord Ferguson of Aberdeen, Fred Lancaster, The Finisher, DF, uh, who else we got here? Scotty, um, the homie Foxing Around, Birdman, shout out to you. Chuck Fins Up, Mario Gonzalez, Al Kilpatrick, Denisha Fig, um, Troy Hicks, Garn, welcome to the Pro Bowl, Birdman, appreciate you. William Burke, JJ Tucker, he said, what's good reason? ESPN just reported the Fins are pushing really hard for OBJ. We'll talk about that. Terry Lynch, Sideshow JBGK. Ricky, my goat, Sean, Finn's in the house, Dad Dean, Adrian Gonzalez, Sean Davis, 1017, man, Jeffrey Ward, Finn Fella, Daniel Meehan, Josh Hart, Sideshow, member for two months, reason you're the best thing for the Dolphins community, keep it up, just one question for you, who's your sleeper this year in the draft, Lewis says hi, Ernest says hi, who's my sleeper, hmm, who would be my sleeper? I don't think enough people are talking about Dadrian Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech safety. I brought him up before. Um, he's my seventh ranked safety, and I think he's got, you know, he can go even higher from that. Um, another one, I think a guard that's really good, and people are sleeping on him a little bit because the school he went to. CJ Hansen out of Holy Cross is another name I think that's kind of a sleeper. Um, who else would I would I consider a big sleeper? Um, I'm trying to see here, looking at my big boards. 
Who else would I consider a sleeper? Um, look at that. I think um, Muhammad Kamara is a sleeper from Colorado State. I think Gabriel Murphy from UCLA in terms of the edge class is getting lost in the mix because of how good Latu is, but Murphy made some big plays for them too. Um, obviously, I think the wide receiver class has some definite sleepers. You know, I think Jalen McMillan's a sleeper. Obviously, Malik Washington, Javon Baker are sleepers, I think. Um, there's sleepers all over, man, when you when you look at all the boards. They really are. They really are. Matt Lee. See, Matt Lee's not a sleeper to me. Matt Lee, you know, if you have Graham Barton as a center, Matt Lee's my fifth guy. If you don't have Graham Barton as a center, Matt Lee's my fourth guy. I actually like Matt Lee's game. I actually do. I think more of a sleeper you know, in that group is, I don't think enough people are talking about, um, Nick Gargilio, Nick Gargiolo, Nick Gargiolo from South Carolina. Nick Gargiolo is, is pretty, he was an interesting film. I thought, how do I feel about Jacob cowing? Eh, I mean, I mean, you guys, you guys basically, Saw how I felt. I mean, right? Um, he, he didn't even really make. Didn't even really make my top seventeen. Right, because you guys saw who my top fifteen receivers were, and then I told you rounding out my top seventeen would be Jalen McMillan and Malik Washington. I think Cowings, you know, Cowings decent. He didn't really blow me away. So, um, yeah, he was decent. So, and let's, uh, you know, but before we get into everything, I do have some things I want to cover. First of all, I saw there was some, um, there was some confusion as to what good, first of all, people out here, okay, you know, whole, why did it take two is so long? First of all, if you've been doing your actual research and following along two every year, he was set up with a quarterback coach at Perform. We've talked about him before. There were pitchers out with them, et cetera, et cetera. So he has worked with a quarterback coach before. The, 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 the whole thing that he has in his BS, again, he's, he's done it before. Perform had their own guy. I forget his name is slipping my name is my mind, but me and Nick even talked about it on one of our uh, yearly get togethers. So he has had a quarterback coach before. So people out here saying, Oh, it took him so long. No, he's already been doing it. But now I need people to go look at how long it took Drew Brees and Tom Brady to get with Tom house and 3d QB Brees It took like six years. Tom Brady didn't start working with Tom house until 2012. I mean, do the math from when he was drafted to when he met, met up with Tom House. Almost 12 years. Okay? So, that's it. And anyone who knows me knows I've been saying he needed to go to Tom House since I've been in this community. I even told Nick Hicks three years ago, yo, you need to link him up with Tom House. So, that's something I've been saying. So, that's nothing new. So, let's talk about what this... And I'll get to that donation in a second here, by, by the way. But let's let us let us get into what. All right, let's get into what's really going on here. All right, um, okay. There's so many things that are going to improve with Tua Tungvaloa just by working with. Tom House and John Beck. So many things. All right. So many things. And some of the things are this. You know, his footwork. All right. His footwork is going to be a huge thing. Um, you know, his footwork has gotten muddied at times. Let's be completely honest with ourselves. Um, it, it's gotten, you know, and just cleaning up and tightening the consistency of to his footwork. 
you know, that alone is going to make him even more deadly and even more accurate from the pocket. All right. Another thing that's going to be cleaned up and you see it, right? They're going to try and get him to consistently have a steady kinetic chain, meaning no more throwing off the back foot and stuff, such. They're going to try and probably increase the drive force of the football. All right. And that's by perfecting his mechanics as much as possible. And, you know, you got to you got to improve that kinetic chain from the toes to the fingertips. Me and Nick Hicks have talked about it multiple times on this channel during our conversations. I mean, why do you think Drew Brees and Tom Brady were able to play until such an advanced age? Because they had perfected mechanics. Because they worked on their mechanics consistently. Arm strength, natural arm strength will fade away. Leg speed, mobility will fade away with time. But if you have consistent mechanics and as perfect and as tight as possible, you will always maximize your drive force. You will always maximize your footwork in the pocket. You will always maximize your accuracy. You will get more out of your body. And it doesn't matter whether you're a limited athlete or the best athlete ever at the position. It doesn't matter. Like, I don't, people do not understand how big of a move this is. I was saying he needed to do this when, after the hip injury. I was saying, okay, you got to get on this and got to start doing this right now. And yeah, was it from the, did he hop on it from the first time I mentioned it? No, but better late than never. I'll be the first one to say better late than never. So, you know, these people out here just trying to look for any, 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 any reason to just absolutely hate on everything this kid does. I'll never get it. I'll never get it. I'll never understand it. I never will. Because, yo, the kid gets better every year and he works harder every year. What more can you ask for right now? We've got one of the hardest workers at the position on our team. And every year he gets better. And that's why I'm saying they better get that. They better get that contract figured out. They better get that figured out real quick. So this guy goes off and has an even better year on top of last year. All of you are saying, oh, we should play on the fifth year option. Y'all going to be really crying when this guy's getting over $60 million next year. That's, that's the reality here. And he's putting in the work. He's putting in the work to grow off of his year from last year. Shout out to Knight, gifting one membership, Polyking305. He got that membership. Shout out. Shout out to Knight. And here's another thing. I mean, we haven't even seen this kid reach his peak, and we haven't had a losing season yet. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So another thing I wanted to talk about too, guys, how bad it was between Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. Holy good golly, Miss Molly. It was not a good situation. I want to play this clip for you guys that I've got here. It was not a good situation, not a good situation in the slightest. All right, uh, well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about how bad this really got. All right, because this got bad. So let me play that clip. In the locker room after the game. This is from Tim Graham. Uh, when the media friends. is allowed to be in there, everything's pretty much fair game unless it's a medical conversation or something happening in the trainer's room. But anything happening at a locker stall is within our rights to report. 
And Josh Allen was sitting there in full uniform with Kyle Allen trying to console him and a stream of players coming up, patting him on the back, dapping him up, uh, saying, hey, you know, we'll get him next time, man. And uh, I quoted Deion Dawkins in the story. And he said, 17 for life. I mean that. You know, they were trying to pick the guy up. He had a towel draped over his head and he just sat there. One thing I didn't include in the story was Stefan Diggs coming up to him after the game. And I didn't include it, I think, because I, as I recall, I didn't include it because I didn't know what Stefan Diggs said to him. But Josh Allen snapped at him. And he said, it's one fucking game. Oh. And kind Ooh. of je- mentioned, motioned, like, I'm not talking to you here. And Diggs walked away, and John and Josh was sat there. And in retrospect, I mean, keeping in mind this was week one when, for all we know, everybody's hunky-dory. But looking back on it now, I wish I would have included that in my story or made some sort of reference to it. Um, maybe Stefan Diggs was saying something nice to him, and he was just, but he didn't snap at anybody else. A, a, a stream of players were coming over, you know, popping him on the shoulder pads, I think, or back patting him on the back or, you know, whatever. Like I said, dapping him up. Hey, man, we'll get him next week. And whatever Stefan Diggs said to him, Josh Allen wasn't having it. And uh, I wish I would have put that in my story at the time, but I think that we look back and I, you know, Stefan Diggs clearly in that moment, and it happened so quickly, uh, would lead maybe one to believe on a, on the regular was getting under Josh Allen's skin. And that was when Stefan Diggs was a superstar still. <clears throat> this wasn't the Stefan Diggs where, and I guess this is the part in the podcast where you have to mention it. Excuse me. Let me hit this mute. Sorry about that frog in my throat. Um, first nine games of the season, 70 receptions, 834 yards, seven touchdowns. That's the first nine games. Last 10, including playoffs, 47 catches, 422, one touchdown. So in less than half the season, or I should say more than half the season, being the last 10, his numbers dipped from 70 to 47, 834 to 422, and 7 to 1. So whatever's going on there, the dynamic wasn't working. The Bills were winning, by the way, while Stephon Diggs' production plummeted. Devin McCourty had told me for that story heading into the regular season finale against the Dolphins, Devin McCourty, who won three Super Bowls with the Patriots and now is working for NBC Sports, um, an analyst for that game, had been breaking down the film as as a, a good analyst would, a good broadcaster would. But this is a guy who also spent time defending or game planning to stop Stephon Diggs personally in a Bill Belichick defense. They played each other twice a year for a while. And this is a guy who has studied Stefan Diggs and his comment to me, which a lot of people blew off or said was stupid, uh, was it looks to me as though the bills are trying to prove that they don't need him. I mean, look at that. It it even goes as far as saying it looks like they were looking like they were trying to prove they didn't need him in the end there. That is absolutely nuts. That is absolutely crazy that that's how bad that got between Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs, where everyone's coming up, patting Josh Allen on the back and Diggs says something to him and Allen snaps at him. Holy man, that got, I mean, clearly they're, they're trying to hide it. They're not trying to talk about it. But like I said, like I said, all right, it was obvious that they must have got the okay. They must have got the okay from Josh Allen to move off of Diggs. There's just no way he would have said, he, he, there's just no way. There's just no way. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy that it got that toxic and it got that bad between Diggs and Allen. And apparently from Diggs' side, it was all because they weren't winning enough. 
crazy how that works out. So let's hop into it. If you haven't seen yet, the Miami Dolphins, they went ahead and they added free agent defensive tackle Tier Tart. And from what we understand, this is simply just a one year deal. Now, I'm a fan of this move. I am a fan of this move. Remember, he started out with Tennessee, then he got moved to Houston. Tier Tart, I mean, you're talking about a, a good, solid player who can give you options all the way from zero to three tech. Now, he, he hasn't been, he, he has never taken on the amount of snaps that Christian Wilkins has taken on. But you look at this as a rotation between him and Benito Jones in that middle. And that's super interesting for me. That's super interesting for me. Again, you got a guy here. Yeah, you can flex him out on the end, but you really want to use him from zero to three tech. And he's a good player. He, he is a good player, man. And I, I like this move. I think this is a smart move. And if you guys remember, let me flash you back to my trade deadline. Remember, he was, look at, he was right there. He was right there as one of my targets. Right there as one of my targets. Now, he ended up did getting moved to Houston. And look at Jordan Brooks is on my trade target list, too. How'd that work out, huh? <clears throat> look, at we've added two of my uh, trade targets. We've added in free agency. I love it. But Tier Tart, I think this was a good move. I think this was a solid move. It gives them more options in the middle. For sure. In the locker room after for the game. For sure. Gives them more options in the middle. And I think, you know, again, this continues to leave their options open for the draft. That's what this does. Now, if Johnny Newton's on the board, not on the board, or Byron Murphy's not on the board, they're not feeling stressed about having to add a 55. They are keeping their options open. Shout out to Kevin Williams. He donated a Finside the NFL membership. And shout out to Hall Hallie D. Barry. Do you think Miami will force feed Tyreek Hill again this year for two for two K? Or do you think they will go back to year one with I'm hoping they go back to the latter? I'm hoping they go back to year one. And they grow off that. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping this 2K stuff, I'm hoping it's a thing of the past. That's what I'm hoping. But they've you've already heard rumblings about it again. But for adding Tier Tart, I think this is a strong move. I think they continue to build up that interior. I mean, look at the pieces they've added on that interior. Listen, they got rid of Wilkins and they brought in a committee of players to fill that void. And I think flaming Finn is onto something. It, 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 as it looks like right now, I think we're either offensive line edge or weapon at 21 and 55. Now, if a Johnny Newton does fall to 21 and you add him to this rotation, that's an interesting thing. I don't think T.R. Tart should stop you from taking a beast defensive tackle if they're on the board at 21. Don't let good players stop you from taking potentially great players. But this does give them the flexibility of if those players are not on the board. Then all of a sudden you're not panicking. You're not running around like chickens with your head cut off. That's what I got to give them props for. Not only are they spending their money well, but they're stretching it so they're not str putting stress on themselves. Come draft time. They're filling as many needs possible with while being as frugal as possible. And this is another solid contributor at a at what's gonna be a good price. That's what this is gonna be. Another low risk, potentially high reward deal. I'm excited about Benito Jones and Tier Tart taking over for Raekwon Davis. I think they're going to give us more production. I'm excited for that second level. We said, okay, we're losing one of the best defensive tackles in the NFL. 
Not only are we going to add a rotation of a bunch of players to try and fill that void, but we're also going to clean up that second level to make sure we're stouter against the run if we don't get that same production up front. It's like getting ready to plug the leak before it even happens. I like it. I think they're getting out ahead of it. I think that secondary is going to be damn good. I think Kendall Fuller at this stage of his career has more to offer this team than what Xavier Howard. Xavier Howard can't even work in the slot at this stage of his career. Let's not lie to ourselves. We've seen him over the last two years have to fit in that slot. He can get cooked. Kendall Fuller gives you that inside-outside flexibility. So, and I'm interested to see. I don't think, does anyone really think there's going to be a drop-off from Deshaun Elliott to Poyer? Let's be real with ourselves right now. Please. That guy's going to have a chip on his shoulder this year. I think Phillips will be back. Don't know if Chubb will be back. So, listen. Other than filling out that edge rotation, filling out that interior of the offensive line and finding that next weapon, I think we're in good shape right now. I think we're in good shape. So, see how it plays out, man. I agree with Bobby Schaus. Shout out to Bobby in the chat. Poyer is the better player, healthy, only concerned. Exactly. I agree. He's going to have a chip on his shoulder to play well this year. You watch. You watch. OBJ. He goes out, and I saw this yesterday, and then it made its rounds this morning. OBJ decided to hop on to... Hot, well, we'll get to OBJ in a second. First, what happened was Tyreek Hill posted this picture saying OBJ to Miami confirmed on his Snapchat. So everyone's like, okay, is OBJ trolling? What's happening here? What's the deal? Da, 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 da. Then Odell Beckham posts about an hour and a half ago. I'm confused today. Did I sign somewhere? Everybody keep hitting me up. And so CT ESPN sources have you in Miami. And Odell says at the bottom, damn, sources got it again. Damn, sources got it again. So, listen, uh, Tyreek knows they're trying to push hard and sign him. Um, th that's where we're at right now. Now, let me see if this works properly. Um, Jeremy Fowler, he uh, he was just on ESPN, and he was talking about the whole situation, and this is what he said. Odell Beckham Jr. and some other free agent wide receivers that are still floating out there. Maybe options for Baltimore. Yeah, let's start with Odell. So Miami Dolphins are trying pretty hard to sign Odell Beckham. They made him, I'm told, at least one contract offer, possibly two. They've been in contact with him and his representatives. They're not quite there yet. There has not been that financial golf bridge. So I'm told Beckham is willing to wait if he has to a little bit. He's done this in the past. Uh, certainly wants to go to the right fit, but there is interest mutually in Miami, and I was told it doesn't count against their comp pick formula for the Dolphins because Odell, it was uh, technically released from Baltimore, right. so that helps Miami in this case. Tyler Boyd still out there. Really so there you go. I mean, you heard the audio there. Um, I didn't want to, sorry, I, I, you know, you heard the audio there, right there for you. Quote, unquote, the Dolphins are trying pretty hard to sign Odell Beckham Jr. All right, you heard the audio right there. Um, listen, you know, again, what do I take this as? They're trying to, they're trying to clear this up. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to clear this up. That's what it sounds like to me. So, uh, you know, again, this tells you a, th a third weapon is integral to what they want to do. Now, I played the auto. I, I didn't play the uh, video just in case ESPN was going to come through and hit me. So I hit y'all with that audio. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. They're, 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 this is very much still in play. You know, Tyree Kill, was he trolling or was he being honest? 
I don't know. I, I feel like this is something where Odell would want to announce to everyone. I feel like this is something Odell wouldn't just want, you know, coming out there leaked by, you know, Antonio Brown and CTESPN. So we'll see how this plays out. We will see how this plays out. But right now it's evident that the Miami Dolphins, they're still trying to make a play for Odell Beckham Jr. Even though we are 20 days away from the draft. Now, maybe it's because they don't want to take the fifth or sixth wide receiver at 21. Maybe that's the maybe that's why. I don't know. Maybe that's why. But I'm gonna be honest with you. If he doesn't it, it I mean if he it, it, you know the fact that Jeremy Fowler said, you know, the quote is, you know, they're trying pretty hard. That tells me they've probably come up a little bit in, in money. I would not. I would not be pushing to pay this man the bank. I just would not be. I mean, for what? Why? What's the point? You got the draft coming up. If you don't want to reach on six or seven at 21, wait till 55 and see what's on the board. I don't think Odell Beckham is going to get signed. I, are they worried about, I know Rasheed Rice. Now they're talking about, they found marijuana, like 10.8 grams and it's a felony and it might even be even worse for him. So maybe they're feeling the pressure to get this potentially done before the chiefs try and swoop in. But, I wouldn't be succumbing to Odell's asking price or his demands when you got this loaded of a draft. You know, and you draft a guy, you're going to get him for at least four years. Odell's for one. Now, is Odell Beckham more proven than a draft pick? 110%. Do we know what Odell is at the NFL level compared to a draft pick? 110%. But if, if, if this guy is asking for us to come close to 10, 11, 12 million dollars, no. Go find, look at, listen. The board fell that way for the Seahawks. They had Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf on the roster. And what happened? What happened? Jackson Smith and Jigba fell to them and they jumped on and they took it. Let that play out. Now I get it. The thing is, if Brian Thomas or Brock Bowers are on the board after 10, you got to worry about a team like the Bengals who lost Boyd and who might lose C Higgins. And they're going to need to start, you know, supplementing their, their weapon position, weaponary positions with draft picks. I get it. Move up a little bit then. So, you know, personally, I'm about, if Odell wants to come here for the right money, sign me up, but do not start feeling the pressure because you know, the the Chiefs and whatever's going on with Rasheed Rice is going on and they might scoop him. You know? Don't feel that pressure. This draft is full of receiver op options. Full of receiver options. Man, listen. If he's on the board, I'm going to be honest with you. I'd take Leggett at 21 before I signed Odell Beckham. I'd take Leggett at 21 over Odell. He ain't going to be on the board at 55, but I'd take him at 21, especially before he becomes a Buffalo Bill. 
especially before he becomes a Buffalo Bill. Because you know that's who they're eyeing. Him or A.D. Mitchell or someone like that. Now, if they do decide to stick to the free agency class, Barry Jackson dropped this. A look at Dolphins wide receiver options if they can't strike a deal with Beckham. and and So here's what they got. With the re-signing of Kendall Lamb and the earlier addition of tight end John U. Smith, Dolphins, Dolphins only have two clear needs on offense. A certifiable number three receiver and an offensive lineman with a skill set to be a high-quality right guard. Not even mentioning left guard. Like, you're just basically giving away that it's a lock to Isaiah Wynn. With the open guard spot, they have had very preliminary talks with the representatives for several veterans while remaining non-committal about whether there will be an offer. What's clear is this. The need for a number three receiver or a starting guard will diminish or disappear altogether if either is addressed with the 21st pick in the first round of the NFL draft on April 25th. In the meantime, here's a look at what's available at guard, and here's what's look left in free agency at wide receiver. So Beckham and Boyd. Beckham remains Miami's top choice, but it remains to be seen if the sides will bridge their financial gap. Beckham, understandably, isn't jumping at an enormous pay cut after making $15 million last season. Same goes with Boyd, who is also seeking far closer to his $10.3 million salary with the Bengals last season. A league source who has spoken to the Dolphins emerged from that conversation, believing they want to spend only a few million on a number three receiver. And that's why, okay, so then draft the guy. Instead of going in these circles with these guys that want to get paid, draft the guy. Boyd caught 67 passes for 677 yards last season has attracted interest from a handful of teams, according to The Athletic. Michael Thomas, a two-time Pro Bowler and 2019 Offensive Player of the Year, was lost for the season in Week 12 knee, with a Week 11 knee injury in 2023, finished with 39 receptions for 448 yards for New Orleans. Dolphins receiver Tyreek Hill has publicly advocated a pursuit but Thomas has played only 20 games combined the past four seasons. The Dolphins during the past month have been more mindful of avoiding players with significant injury history. So there you go. So they're looking for guys they can depend on. Michael Gallup, who's had significant injuries, signed a five-year, $62.5 million extension with the Cowboys in 2022, but didn't live up to the contract, was released last month. He's on the board. He's still out there. DJ Shark, another name I've mentioned. Um, he had six drops last year, 35 passes caught for 525 yards and five touchdowns. Um, and that's the thing, right? What he mentions here, he has the re requisite speed and size that they like. Now, Marquez Valdez Scantling, eh, eh, you know, he, he had three catches for 32 yards on a Super Bowl. Eh, Allen Robinson, that's three years too late. Hunter Renfro, I mean, that's a guy I would like, right? I mean, you know, the reason this might be why they don't see him because he's primarily a slot receiver, but that can also return punts and kickoffs where Braxton Berrios, if you get Hunter Renfro, what's the point of bringing Braxton Berrios back? That's basically where you're at. McCall Hardman, Hill's former teammate, that, like he's just a vertical guy. What does he offer you more than a vertical threat? And then we start getting like Jarvis Landry and other options here. So, you know, and Chase Claypool's negotiating with a CFL team. And Robbie Chosen's a free agent. You know, really, let's be honest here. Other than Odell Beckham and Tyler Boyd, you can pretty much miss me with that list. I would take Xavier Leggett over tw uh, 21 and then over all of those options, to be honest with you. I really would. So, and look at what they want. This is why you have to really take into consider what race and a weapon in the first round. The, the, this is the, the MO. What's the MO? They want a legit weapon, but they don't want to spend much. How do you get that? The draft. Two plus two is four. That's literally what that is. That's literally what that is. Two plus two is four. That's what they're telling you. We do not want to spend much on a weapon, 
but we want a legit weapon. I mean, how does that work other than the draft? OBJ is like, you know, right there in that article, told you representatives from the Boyd and, and Dolphins negotiations basically came out saying they only want to spend a couple million. While Boyd, he said, Boyd's looking towards 10 million and OBJ does not want to take a drastic pay cut from the 15 million. So what does that tell me? These guys are both around 10 million. So do you want to spend 10 million on OBJ? Now, that could be 6, 7 million guaranteed up to 10 million or up to 11 million, not necessarily 10 or 11 guaranteed. But do you want to spend that kind of money? Like, look at this. If Leatu Latu is gone, if Dallas Turner is gone, right? You know, if basically the top two or top three guys for the premium positions are gone, you know, stick to your board. Stick to your board and whatever happens, happens. But yeah, I would rather... Draft Xavier Leggett at 21, then pay Odell Beckham Jr. or Tyler Boyd $10 million. That's just where I'm at. And I don't even necessarily agree with drafting Xavier Leggett at 21. I think that's a little rich. But I would rather draft him at 21 than pay either one of those guys that kind of money. Real talk. So... Just saying. Speaking of the draft, the Miami Dolphins, they are hosting USC's Kalen Bullock. He is Mel Kuyper's number seven draft eligible safety. He's my number six. And you will see it. I, my next big board coming out is offensive tackle, then safety. And he, you'll see that. So all pack, he made the all, and all pack 12 last season is visiting the Dolphins per a photo post on social media. Fins can bring up to 30 non-locals for visits. Stiggers, Eric All, All, and Christian Boyd have been, among others, summoned. Then there's going to be ones we don't hear about, i.e. Devon Achan last year. He was a 30 visit that they snuck in and didn't tell and really talk about. They didn't let sneak out into the media because of how much they really liked him. So, you know, now for me and Bullock, I'm a big fan of Bullock. I think you got a guy who's got a lot of talent, man. He's got a lot of talent when you look at it. Um, you know, now, you know, he looks most comfortable at the free safety position, you know, in, in terms of like box, uh, you know, he's only 190 pounds, right? Um, you know, and he's not the best in the box in terms of getting off blockers and making plays in the run game. Um, I just don't see him as a box safety. I see him as a guy you add behind Javon Holland. Um, now that said, he has made some, some big plays, some big plays for USC. Um, I, I'm just, uh, you know, and Hey, he's a bit of a ball hawk, right? Uh, two interceptions this past season, five the year before that, two the year before that, nine over the last three seasons. Um, I'm a fan of him. I am a fan of him. Um, what, what's good too is, he, you know, he only allowed a passer rating of about 97 in his area. Had seven pass breakups as well this year. So he can make plays on the football, has instincts for the football, size, you know, size is going to be an issue for him. Um, the physical aspect of the game in the box, that'll be an issue for him. But, you know, <clears throat> my sixth safety. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting, interesting move. I wouldn't take him at 55 or 21. I think that's a little rich. Now, I don't think he'll be on the board when we come back around in the fifth round. But you never know. Doing their due diligence doing their due diligence. So you got to respect it. And Hey, you don't know what's happening in the future with Javon Holland. Just saying another very intriguing prospect visit. Very, very, very intriguing. 
Isaac Garendo from Louisville, the absolute athletic freak and monster. I mean, this is very intriguing. You know, you saw him, you know, you do your mock drafts and you can be able to get him in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. He not, that ain't happening. That is not happening. Especially after that, you know, pro day that he had where he ran a four three three forty and a one five five ten yard split, you know, a ten nine broad jump, a forty one and a half inch vertical. You know, this guy can also be a kick returner. He's, he, you know, he was a pretty damn good kick returner for Louisville. All right. And, you know, the one thing guys will like about him when they watch him at the next level, very careful with the football. You know, he protects the football very well. He's very mindful of it. So, and he offers you, you know, I can see the interest because not only does he got the speed, he flashes as a receiver out of the backfield too. So I understand the interest. It's just, I think you're going to have to take, you know, one of the, I think he goes in the top three rounds because of how he tested. I really do. I don't think he's there in the fifth, sixth, seventh. I don't see it happening. So now maybe because of his age and he does have a little bit of an injury history, maybe that helps him slip a little bit or Maybe because gap teams, because he doesn't explain, display a ton of power up in the upper body. Maybe that'll be why, um, you know, teams let him slip a little bit. But we're talking about freakish numbers. We're talking like Madden numbers here that he put up in testing. So, you know, and I agree with Jason Stamps. I'd rather have him over Ahmed. 110% I agree with you. Get Salvin Ahmed off my television. I agree with you 110%. Stop, Aaron. Don't come in here and start the pod, brother. I know what you're saying. We ain't taking no quarterback at 21 or 55. We got bigger needs on hand, my friend. We need day one contributors, not guys who are going to sit behind Tua. This guy comes in. You're crazy. Um, Brian, you got to be specific. Is that sweat or Murphy? I'm going to go ahead and guess you mean Byron, Mur Byron Murphy, right? That's what I'm going to guess you mean. Guys, over 520 of you in the room. Smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new. I don't know why they aren't giving Chris Brooks that look. Murphy? Yeah, I like him. I'm not... I want Newton, man. If we're going to get a defensive tackle, I want Newton. I think Newton's the best one-for-one one-off one to replace Christian Wilkins with higher upside as a pass rusher. Newton's, man, that film was just so fun to watch of him. I didn't have him on my man crush list because that's Neil's guy and I didn't want to infringe, but damn it, if I would have if that wasn't the case. He was just so fun to watch, man. So fun to watch. And, you know, what's funny is Omar, I was talking, Omar will be on the show next week, Omar Kelly. And he was getting into the DTs this week. And he asked me, he said, hey, reason, you know, your opinion, where should I start? I said, start in Texas. I said, you're, you're going to see two different styles. You're going to see you know, Byron Murphy, who's one of the better pass rushers on this class, who can flex out from three, you know, all the way out to the edge. Uh, and then look at a guy like Trevante Sweat, who flexes from the zero to the three. Basically, he's a gap eater. You know, just a lane clogger, two different styles on the same offensive line. It was crazy, man, how, you know, when you think of the talent they had. I think that's very much in play if the right guy falls. Because there's, there's mocks that have Mims going before we even draft now. So if the right guy falls, yeah, I do think. I do think 110% you will see, you know, like if a Troy fought news there, I think they run up. You know what I mean? I know people are really getting really high on Barton. I, I 21's rich, man. 21 is rich. You're on the clock at 21 and Brian Thomas, Newton, Murphy and fought new on the clock. Uh, fought new fought new Newton, uh, Thomas, then Murphy. In that order. 
See how quickly I answered that though, eh? But yeah, I'd go Troy Fontenew, Newton would be behind him, then Brian Thomas, then Byron Murphy. That's how I'd have that rank. Fontenew to me could be either the top guard in this class. I have him either as a top guard, or I'll give you a bit of a spoiler here for all you waiting for my OT board. He's the fourth tackle and the number one guard for me. I'm running, baby, if he's on the on the board at 21. I'm running. I'm running. I, I, I'm running to that. I'm just saying. You, 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 he, he's just too good, man. That guy is just too good and, and has... If you have the opportunity to draft a special lineman... You draft that special lineman, my friend. You do not let that you do not let that special lineman slip out of your feet. Slip out through your hands, sorry. So um you know, that that's all I gotta say. So yeah, I'm uh I'm I'm taking him all day. So and yeah, man, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be interesting to see how it works out. Shout out to all of you. Over five hundred and thirty of you in the room. Finally, interesting thing here. Um from Sean Merriman. All right, all of you people back in the day remember when he played for the Chargers and when he that guy used to be a freaking beast. So this is what he said. A reality check regarding Miami Dolphins, Jalen Phillips, Achilles rehab. Four months into Jalen Phillips' rehab for a torn Achilles, the Miami Dolphins remain publicly optimistic. He'll be healthy for the whole season. But no recovery progress is a straight line. And even though Phillips has looked fantastic in videos he's posted to social media, there's no guarantee he'll be ready for week one, particularly given the severity of the injury. Sean Merriman on Miami Dolphins linebacker Jalen Phillips. Phillips certainly will benefit from improvements in sports medicine over the last decade. The return to play time frame for Achilles tear seems to get shorter by the year. So it's not an apple to or apples to apples comparison between Phillips journey and what Achilles injuries did more than a decade ago to Sean Merriman's career. But the former's charger great experience should not be dismissed either. Merriman suffered Achilles injuries in consecutive seasons that effectively ended his career at age 27. He spoke about Phillips' outlook during a promotional appearance on behalf of his Lights Out Extreme Fighting League's big event Saturday in South, Carolina, South California. The 18 and over event will be held at Thunder Studios in Long Beach. I was praying for him, man, because he's an up-and-coming guy off the edge. I love his game. The last thing you want to do is rush that because it is by far, in my opinion, because I've had knee reconstruction, I've had shoulders, I've had Achilles. The Achilles is the worst to come back from. The challenges in returning returning from that major trauma, Merriman said there are several. Number one, even when you get back healthy, there's a mental thing. If I push, push off of this too hard or if I step back on the wrong, am I going to tear it again? So you're going to get over the mental part of it. That's going to be a difficult thing for him. And number two, the compensation. This is why he has to take time on getting back because if he doesn't, you could tear the other one. Or you're going to have the opposite knee is going to start hurting. The opposite side of your back is going to start hurting. You're going to be pulling the opposite groin. So you have to watch the compensation, man. But he'll be back. He'll be fine. But he has to take his time getting back. Because if not, you can risk other major things happening. So what's his timeline to return? In other words, Phillips should be more focused on coming back fully healthy than beating some deadline. Fortunately for him, the Dolphins have the same outlook. Mike McDaniel told reporters, that they had to protect both Phillips and Bradley Chubb, who's recovering from a torn ACL from themselves during their offseason rehab. Relative to timelines, we specifically don't have those for two years. We don't have those for those two, McDaniel said. We've had to mandate that they have a week off of rehab just recently, both of them, because they literally live there. They've had a suedo tape on the floor parking spots for the little scooters that they've graduated from. They're both really doing exactly what you'd expect from those two individuals, which is absolutely attacking the process, but doing it from a perspective that they don't want to get healthy for one week. They want to get healthy for the whole season. So that's what they're working towards. Achilles tears, while certainly not the career death sentence they were a generation ago, still remain quite dicey. The return to play timeline is 9 to 12 months. 
which means that Phillips, who got hurt the day after Thanksgiving, has a decent chance of playing in the opener. But how effective will he be? The findings of a 2017 study into the impact of Achilles injuries on NFL players were a bit concerning. Post-operative performance scores were significantly worse for running backs and linebackers compared to pro-operative scores. Linebackers had significantly worse post-operative score score performances when compared to matched controls. So, listen, a couple things on this. I've heard Chubb. I've heard, you know, it's not just a simple ACL tear for him. So I've heard Chubb is actually, you know, from what I understand, Chubb will take a little longer than Phillips. Um, and that's not just because of the timeline of when they both went out. Um, now, 110%, Jalen Phillips cannot cannot rush his back. And here's the reason why I don't think he will rush his back. It's because he knows not only is the fifth-year option in play, but he's going to have to have a good season this year to potentially get an extension next offseason so Miami can spread out their money on that fifth-year option. So it's imperative for Jalen Phillips to have a good season. It's imperative for Jalen Phillips to keep his body at the fittest level possible because missing games will affect his future money. So, you know, I, I agree. Achilles, listen, I'm going to tell you this much. When you talk about injuries and stuff, like when you talk about like movies and stuff, like horror movies, whenever the killers, like, I forget what movie that was, but that movie where, I don't know. It was like this principal or something. He was standing in front of his car and the killer was under the car and like sliced his like back, you know, Achilles, like Achilles are always the, you know, I never, I never cringe when I see someone get their head cut off. I never cringe when I see an arm get ripped off, but when someone gets their Achilles like popped or like cut or whatever, Oh, it just, Ooh, even thinking about it right now gives me a little bit of a cringe. You know what I mean? It's always been that injury where, to be honest with you, in every sport I played, whether it's hockey or football or baseball or when I played basketball, um, I don't really play basketball. I made my middle school team. Other than that, I didn't really play basketball much other than like pickup games, going to the Y and stuff like that in high school. But Achilles has always been the injury that it's always like, oh, like just thinking about it gives me the shivers. You know what I mean? So, oh, oh. So I agree, man, especially look at what Merriman said. You don't want to overcompensate because then you end up popping. You could pop your other Achilles. You know what I mean? Like, and it's crazy when you hear people talk about like Achilles, how it, it feels like someone just like punched, like, like punched the back of your ankle, like as hard as possible. Like, oh, so, you know, oh, just thinking about it. <laughs> So I agree, you know, you got to, this is not an injury you can joke around with. You see guys come back from ACL tears a little quicker. Achilles, man, do not, do not mess around with this. You know, you got too much of a great career ahead of you, Jalen. Don't rush this back. This, you know, you are too important to the future of this team. So we wish you well on your recovery. Can't wait to see you back in the field. We know it's going to happen this season. So, shout out to Jalen Phillips working his ass off to get back. Shout out to all of you, man. Over 530 of you in YouTube watching me on a Friday. Appreciate all of you for continuing to support. The next big board coming for all of you guys will be offensive tackle. Um, if any news breaks, you know what time it is. I will be back this weekend. For all of you watching WrestleMania, enjoy WrestleMania weekend. I am probably going to target maybe Sunday for another show. So we'll see how it works out. But latest I'll be back is Monday. So you can look out for that. Another big board coming your way. Appreciate all you guys for continuing to support the channel. I'm probably going to drop a three takes video for Patreons this weekend. And I'll have an update for channel members as well off of that three takes. So 
Appreciate each and every one of you coming through. Now, I know there was a donation here, and it was, where are we? Uh, da, 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 da. Night. WrestleMania prediction, I think Cody does win. But I don't think Rock turns on Roman like people think. I think Rock's going to come out to help Roman on night two because I think they win on night one. Blood, I think the Bloodline wins on night one. And then I think Stone Cold Steve Austin comes out night two and stops the Rock from interfering and helps Cody win. That's what I think happens on night two. All right? Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new. And as always, you already know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day. And we'll see all y'all in the next one. Take it easy, guys.